Okay, welcome. We're gonna take a departure from the CCU, which is what I normally like to talk to you guys about. And I'm gonna have a record-breakingly short lecture for me because we're gonna talk about prevention. Huh, other side of the spectrum. So um, I recently went to this conference where we talked all about how we can prevent cardiovascular disease from happening in the first place. Uh, that's probably, we're not in danger of that happening anytime soon here in Kentucky. So I still have a job for at least the duration of my career, but there is some hope that we could potentially reverse a lot of cardiovascular disease. But as I sat and listened to two weeks worth of lectures talking about, you know, the incremental difference between salt and the diet, um, I really wanted to boil this down to what is practical for you guys when you're sitting in your primary care clinic and the patient has 17 other medical problems that starts with like pulmonary hypertension and out of control diabetes and they have their toe hurts. Uh, what can you really do for them in a 15 minute clinic visit to try and get at what we all know which what is true, which is that prevention is the best medicine. So um, also prepare to be totally depressed about your own health habits. Okay, ready? So um, we're gonna talk about Life Simple 7 today. Okay, so what do I want you to get out of this today? Well, <clears throat> I'm gonna teach you about the American Heart Association's approach to prevention, which is called Life Simple 7. Um, I'm gonna teach you how to apply appropriate screening methods in your clinic to think about Life Simple 7, and then properly treat all those conditions associated with it. And then most importantly is number four. I'm gonna try to give you some very practical, attainable tips, both for yourself in clinic and also for your patients, kind of low-hanging fruit. None of this is gonna be new information to you. You know all of it already, but I'm trying to distill it down and show you a little bit of the evidence behind why we say what we say. I wanna start with two cases. Um, we're gonna see the cases now and then we're gonna come back to them at the end of the lecture. So uh, this case, number one, you've all seen this person in your clinic. 52-year-old Hispanic man, hasn't seen a doctor in 15 years, but now his wife makes him come in. No complaints, no known medical conditions. Works as a forklift operator, does not exercise regularly. He's got a big gulp in, in clinic with him and also a bag of pork rinds. Not opened, but he has the bag of pork rinds. He smokes a half a pack per day. His wife also wants him to quit. She's a real gem. Uh, thank you, like a few laughs. You guys are a rough crowd today. Come on, loosen up. All right. Uh, his mom died of a heart condition at age 62. So on exam, heart rate is 77, blood pressure 152 over 87. He's a little short for his weight with a BMI of 39.6. So just want you to think about, you, this is every clinic session you have somebody like this, right? So think about what you immediately would wanna do for him, what you'd wanna measure, and we're gonna come back to him at the end of the lecture. Case number two, you guys might not see these patients in your safety net clinic as often, but I get them in my cardiology practice. So a 55-year-old white woman with a history of hypertension presents for routine yearly checkup. She's concerned because her sister, who's 49, recently diagnosed with coronary artery disease on a CT scan that was obtained for lung cancer screening. She does not smoke or drink. She works as a manager for a local company, exercises three days a week for about 20 minutes on the treadmill. She's a vegetarian. So worried well, yeah? Her heart rate is 60, blood pressure 139 over 82, weight 145, BMI 24.1. She's a diligent patient, so she already has her labs with her, so you know her glucose is 90. Total cholesterol 215, HDL 25, and LDL 195. So I want you to again pause and think about what you would do for her. Most of you are thinking, I'm so bored. There's like no emergency, I'm not have to run an ICU on her in my clinic. <laughs> so she's a very different patient than the first one but there's still a lot that we can do for her in terms of cardiovascular prevention. So we'll come back to both of those patients as we move on. You've seen these maps, they're horribly depressing. This is showing you the trend in obesity rates from 1990 up until 2010. And in 1990, you know, only about uh, less than 15% of the country was obese or overweight. But uh, then as you go to 2000, everything starts to get worse. And now by 2010, we're up to a lot of the country areas having more than 30% of the patients being obese. So this is not a surprise. Although I'm gonna say something that after practicing both in Baltimore and in Kentucky, you're gonna get really offended when I say this, but um, your eyes don't can't tell obesity and overweight anymore, right? So you have to measure that BMI on all your patients because you've all done it, right? And then surprising the BMI was like 70. And you were like, I mean, I just thought they were a little bit overweight. So make sure that you're measuring this because literally we, we are surrounded by an obesity epidemic. So your assessment of whether or not that person meets criteria for obesity is your clinical judgment is wrong, all wrong. 
So here's how the American Heart Association is approaching cardiovascular health. And we're really being very optimistic in how we want to approach this, even though the health of the country is declining at a rapid pace. And by the way, if you track the global spread of McDonald's, you can track the global spread of heart disease. And as McDonald's goes, so goes the rates of heart disease. So there's no question that diet is a big deal here. But anyway, we're trying to not just get to secondary prevention or primary prevention. We're actually trying to think about something that we call ideal cardiovascular health. So instead of just preventing the heart disease, we're trying to obtain ideal cardiovascular health. And so these are the seven components that the American Heart Association includes in ideal cardiovascular health. So manage blood pressure, control cholesterol, reduce blood sugar, get active, eat better, lose weight, and stop smoking. I mean, that sounds like everything you try to tell every patient, right? (laughs) But let me go through each one of these, tell you about the specific recommendations, and then also a little bit about where that evidence comes from. Okay, manage blood pressure. So I'm sure you spent a lot of time in clinic talking about the most recent guidelines that came out in 2017 that changed the definition of hypertension. So now we're considering hypertension to be anyone with a systolic over 130 or a diastolic over 80. Half of you in this room have a diastolic over 80 right now, I can tell you, especially if you who's opening the bag of chips. Okay, but in any case, <laughs> uh, they're feeling nervous. I, like, I gotta call somebody out, okay. <clears throat> What's important about this is this is our attempt. <laughs> no, don't, you're, you're young, you're fine, it's okay. He's like, put it away. <laughs> oh, it's empty, already done, the damage is done. Okay. <laughs> So uh, what's important about this is that we are trying to identify and be more aggressive about how we're treating these things. So the red was the old guidelines, and then the blue is the added percentage of the population in the new definition that gets added. So 45% of Americans are hypertensive by this definition, right? That's bananas. Uh, 36% of people warrant medication, and 53% are undertreated according to these new guidelines. So how do you remember who you need to treat? I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because I know you think about this in your primary care clinics a lot, but here's the very basic way to think about it. Stage 1 hypertension, 130 to 139. If they have a 10-year ASCVD risk greater than 10%, you treat them. What's ASCVD risk? I'm gonna talk to you about that a lot and also show you um, some resources to go and calculate it. This is the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk score. There are a lot of risk scores out there. There's Framingham, there's various different ones. ASCVD is probably the best risk score. You need their blood pressure, their race, whether they smoke or not, whether their hypertension is treated, and you need their cholesterol profile uh, and their age and gender. Those are the components in ASCVD. Dr. D. Philippus, who many of you have worked with, actually wrote a paper comparing the different risk score calculators that we have out there, and ASCVD probably performs the best, especially in minority populations and women who aren't well represented in the Framingham cohort that initially came up with that risk score. So if you're gonna calculate one risk score, just do ASCVD, that's all you need to know. So if someone comes in with hypertension and no diabetes or no coronary diseases, et cetera, you should calculate an ASCVD risk on them. If it's greater than 10%, you're gonna treat that hypertension. And then everybody else, if they get greater than 140, you treat them. That's pretty easy. Now, of course, diabetics, different guidelines, I'm not putting all of that in here. This is just for your general population, all comers. So that's pretty easy to think about blood pressure. What's important about this is that blood pressure and stroke are intimately related. So if we could control hypertension in the world, we would eliminate almost all strokes. Not all, but almost all strokes. So this is really important. Uh, If you have questions about whether you should treat your patient or not, targetbp.org is a good um, um, resource. Okay, now, we always talk about diet and exercise, but how much bang for your buck do you really get? I love this little chart. This comes from ACC and AHA. So weight loss, for every kilo they lose, they're gonna drop one entire point, one millimeter of mercury. Okay, that's good. Some of our patients have like 200 kilos to lose. (laughs) Just kidding. (laughs) So they're not gonna drop their blood pressure by 200 points, obviously. But in general, weight loss is gonna get you about one millimeter mercury per kilo. The DASH diet, which you probably have heard about, familiar with, is the low sodium diet, high vegetables, etc. That's pretty good. You can get about 10 millimeters of mercury difference. So that can take someone from stage two to stage one, keep them off meds if that's their motivation. Okay, reduce dietary sodium intake to less than 1,500 milligrams a day. I'm going to call you out again. I need that chip bag. Can you read me how much sodium is in it, please? I don't know what it is, actually. Is it chips or Smart Pop or something? Uh, it's chips. Chips, good. How much sodium is in it? 
190. 190, is that in one serving? Most, most serving is two and yeah. Okay. All right, so that is a good 400 milligrams right there in the, in the snack. Anyone know how many milligrams the average American consumes of sodium a day? Yeah, four grams. <laughs> so I dare any of you to drop your dietary sodium to less than 1,500. It's almost impossible, and the world tastes bland. Okay, but if you do that, you can get five or six millimeters of mercury points. Number one, it's almost impossible to do because all of our food has sodium added. Number two, that's not going to get you out of the range where you need to be treated. So great, yes, do this, but it's not going to take away the need for meds. And then exercise, also good. Aerobic exercise, 90 to 150 minutes per week. Does anyone in here get that much? And I'm not counting CPR or walking in the hallways with me when you're around. <laughs> Taking the stairs counts. Okay, I've got one hand in the, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, I'm very impressed. I don't get this much aerobic exercise per week. But if you did, you can get five to eight millimeters of mercury. So I think this is a great chart to give you a sense that diet, exercise, lifestyle, this is all important, but it's not gonna treat that guy with a pressure of 170. Okay, questions on any of this blood pressure? All right, good. I told you you're going to be depressed about your own life. All right, controlling cholesterol. So I talked to you a little bit about the ASCVD risk score already. There's an app that you can get for your phone. I recommend everybody has it. I have it on my phone for a clinic. You can also go online, cvriskcalculator.com. This is really important to do, especially when you're thinking about treating people for their cholesterol. There's been a lot of uh, variation in cholesterol guidelines, even in my time of practice. I'm going to show you the current guidelines, but I will tell you that most likely our next iteration of cholesterol guidelines is going to go back to treating to targets. They took away your target LDLs completely in the last round. They're probably going to come back in the next round, and I'll show you a little bit about why. So there are four groups of people who benefit most from a high-dose statin. Somebody tell me who one might be. Diabetics. Okay, diabetics. Excellent. And I didn't bring candy because that would be a little bit uh, <laughs> counterproductive here, right? Okay. Coronary. Good. Anybody who has cardiovascular, coronary vascular, cerebrovascular, peripheral vascular disease, good. Anybody else? LDL higher than 190. Good. Excellent. LDL higher than 190. They all get treated. And then one more group. And hint, it has to do with what's on the screen already. If your risk score is greater than, this one is 7.5% over 10 years. Okay, good. You guys hit them all. So these four groups of people all deserve to just be on a Torva 80 or Resuva 40 and call it a day. Super easy. Stay tuned because I'm sure we're going to go back to treating the targets and we're going to have to measure again. But for now, everybody in your primary care clinic should have their lipid profile checked and then you can calculate their risk score. What's the biggest weighted component of that risk score? Does anyone know? No? This is what, what makes the biggest difference in the risk score. What bumps you up the most? Age. It's age, yeah. So a 45-year-old versus a 65-year-old, pretty much everybody, once they're over 60, is going to qualify because that's when all of us in America have our events. Okay, good. So that's, that's simple for cholesterol. That's the current guidelines. I love this because it makes my life so easy, but I'm going to start having to treat the targets again, so stay tuned. Uh, this was actually done by a colleague of mine. It's a really interesting paper. So this is looking at, there's a big debate, right? Is it just the statin alone or is it the LDL reduction that matters? So this is showing you on the x-axis the difference in between the two groups in each trial of the LDL that's achieved, so a ratio. And then on the y-axis is your um, risk of major vascular events. So you can see that as you have a bigger between group difference in LDL, no matter which medication you use, your relative risk goes down because that's an inverted axis. So this is with statins, niacin, et cetera, PCSK9, of course, they get a huge reduction in LDL. So the number actually does matter, and the lower the LDL, the greater the decreased risk. So probably we're going to go back to treating the targets, but it works, and this is the evidence for it right here. All right, so that's, you know, funny, but kind of true, right? I, I put the big gulp in the first <clears throat> patient presentation because this is what people drink, and people are confused, right? They think, oh, no, it's tea, it's not soda. <laughs> Don't even get me started on diet soda. But uh, you guys are experts at managing blood sugar because you do this for your diabetics all the time, but sugar-sweetened beverages are one of the most evil things that has happened in our country, and we are all accustomed to and addicted to drinking them. Again, you all feel bad. Is anyone drinking Coke in the audience? I don't see it because you all have cups, child size right there. That's water. Good job. Um, but
but that's a very easy way to cut that out, and I'm going to show you in a little while about how that would um, impact weight as well. So again, low-hanging fruit, easy things for people to do, can titrate their insulin all day long, but get them to stop drinking those sugar-sweetened beverages. Okay, the next <clears throat> life symbol seven is get active. So this cartoon, for those who can't read it, says, it says right here, this exercise app must be used with actual exercising. And then the person responds, that explains a whole lot. Okay, so we all have things on our phone and our Fitbits and all sorts of stuff. And all of that is good to help to monitor things, but it turns out that doesn't really necessarily motivate us. Um, so there is a 2008 guideline for how much physical activity we're supposed to get. This is in the process of being revised right now, and I'm pretty sure they're going to recommend more. Does anybody know what the recommendation is for exercise? More than what we all get. Oh, okay. So 150 minutes per week in any combination, any amount that you like of moderate intensity. So moderate intensity is a brisk walk like what you do between Jewish and here. Um, and going upstairs is a little bit more than moderate intensity. So you guys actually all get this because of rounding, which is why you don't gain a ton of weight during residency to offset the donuts I bring you on the weekends. Um, so that's what's recommended. And then muscle strength, two plus days per week. But uh, if you get more, it's better. So there's actually evidence showing improved outcomes for more exercise per week. I told you this was going to depress all of you. So that's the guidelines. I try to tell my patients any combination that they want to do. If they want to do 10 minutes here, 10 minutes there, take a little break, stand up, run around for a minute, that's still going to accomplish something. Now, you may have heard the slogan, sitting is the new smoking. Has anybody heard that before? Okay, maybe just in our prevention cardiology world. So how about standing desks? Anyone have friends or family who are in business that use a standing desk? So sedentary lifestyle is a really big problem, but it's a big problem not just for, <laughs> big problem, did you hear that? Okay. Uh, it's not just for people that are sitting in front of the TV necessarily. This is also because our work has gone from a far more active vocations to far more sedentary vocations. So sitting is the new smoking is one of the slogans that people are using to describe this. So this is a summary of a bunch of different studies. On your x-axis, you have increasing sitting time. On your y-axis, you have risk of mortality, straight up death. And as you increase your sitting time, all right, um, look, at, look at how much your mortality can go up. A relative risk of 1.6 if you're sitting more than 100 minutes a day. So this is really a problem, and trying to get people to not sit is important. I didn't include it, but there is some evidence about can you offset your sitting by getting up at intervals to walk. It's probably okay, but the sitting itself is really causing a lot of problems. So we want to recommend active lifestyle for our patients. Okay, next one in Life Simple 7 is eat better. This is a really cool slide. This is looking at the top 10 causes of death on the left-hand side of the screen. And then associated risk factors color-coded. So each risk factor has a colored dot that correlates with which of these causes of death it contributes to. No surprise, number one cause of death in 2013 for both men and women is ischemic heart disease. It's why I have a job. Now, if you look over at associated risk factors, okay, tobacco, yeah, it's bad. But look at this. For both men and women, dietary risk is the number one associated risk factor with not just ischemic heart disease, but most of these causes of death. So of all your modifiable risk factors that we're working on in this Life Simple 7, diet is probably the one with the most bang for the buck. Right? That, to me, this is really, really impressive. There's some evidence out there about negative versus positive dietary counseling. So we've all done this, I mean, mostly in our, the heart failure patients when they get discharged or you're talking to someone in clinic. We just tell them what not to eat, right? What to avoid. But for a lot of people who have only ever eaten fried fish and never baked a fish, or when you say vegetables, they're thinking about deep fried vegetables or something that has added lard to it. That's not helpful because they don't know what to replace it with. So in terms of what you should eat or what you can eat, Mediterranean diet is the one that has the best evidence from a cardiovascular perspective. In a minute, we'll talk about weight loss and diets for weight loss, but I'm not talking about that here. I'm just talking about for ideal cardiovascular health, what's the best diet? It's Mediterranean. So the Mediterranean diet is lean proteins, fish, chicken, turkey, lots of fruits and vegetables, nuts and legumes, healthy oils and fats like olive oil, whole grains, fat-free or low-fat dairy, and then avoid, I did have to put that in there, the saturated fat, sugar, and sodium. Okay, so a cool thing about the Mediterranean diet. They did a study where they took two groups of people. Both were already eating the Mediterranean diet. 
Then they added equal calories to the two groups, and one of the groups got those calories in nuts, and the other group got the calories in olive oil. The olive oil group had improved cardiovascular mortality rates. It's like a shot of olive oil at night. So I don't do that, but I do only cook with olive oil because of this reason. And I'm pretty liberal with it, I will say, because olive oil is good for you. So this is what you can eat. Um, and it's not a fad diet. This is just a way of doing things. And, and it's helpful to tell people about this, but we all know how impossible it is to get through dietary counseling in a clinic session. So I'm a big fan of referring them to a dietitian to try and help with things like portion sizes and recipes and options and, and all that kind of stuff that's pretty impossible to talk about in a clinic visit. I included this in here so you can go back and reference it later, but if you're interested in the articles talking about the various diets like DASH or Mediterranean or dietary pattern and stroke, etc., this is a good list of resources where you can go find the evidence behind this. Diet is actually extremely difficult to study when it comes to looking at outcomes, um, and there's obviously a big multi-million dollar industry surrounding it, but here's what we have in terms of actual evidence. Okay, next is lose weight. Again, I have this generic to anger no one uh, soda on the, or pop or whatever. What do we call it in Kentucky? Coke? Is it all, everything is a Coke? Okay, whatever. I'm from California, so this is soda to me. So when it comes to losing weight, everybody knows how difficult it is to get our patients to lose weight, even to try and lose weight ourselves. So this is where, to me, the low-hanging fruit is, again, those sugar-sweetened beverages. So if we look at not just obese but overweight, 70 to 80 percent of Americans are overweight or obese. That is horrifying, right? Horrifying. If you drink one can of soda per day and you don't burn it off, you will gain 15 pounds in a year. We should get rid of all the vending machines. One can of soda, 15 pounds per year. So if you cut out one can of soda or sugar-sweetened beverage per day and you don't replace it with, this, with calories, you're going to lose 15 pounds in a year. That is easy to do, and most people don't even realize that they're consuming 15 pounds when they chug that Coke in the afternoon. When I set weight loss goals with my patients, I try to be reasonable, right? Because we all know how frustrating it can be to set a goal and not to make it, or to have no goal at all. How many of your patients say they want to lose weight, but they have no idea how much or when or what? So five pounds a month is really the most um, that you can sustainably lose and keep off. So I try to remind them of that and to help them set goals. So one strategy I use, this is also a very culturally laden concept of what a, a healthy weight is. So if you ask a woman in one, um, one race versus another, they might have a very different image of what is a healthy or attractive weight. So I always ask my patient, how much do you want to weigh or how much do you think you should weigh? You'd be surprised at what people say that they think is a healthy weight again because of this cultural concept. So ask them what they want to weigh or how much weight they want to lose and then over what period of time to help them try and set some manageable goals that they might be able to see some improvement on. So if they have 100 pounds to lose, that's not going to happen between you know now and derby. So try to help them have a reasonable goal. Unless they're, yeah, anyway, okay. So <clears throat> in terms of how much, in terms of diet and losing weight, it's very simple. It is math. You have to burn more than you can than you eat. That's it. There's no fad diet that makes it better than another. It's not keto or paleo or whole third or whatever or whatever. Those all are for different reasons that people do that. And those diets can sometimes help you feel full and consume fewer calories. But there's no such thing as the magic bullet, right? So when it comes to weight loss. I don't necessarily talk about Mediterranean diet with my patient, even though that's what I want them to eat. I just say you have to burn more calories than you consume. So exercise can help with that, but you can't exercise your way out of bad eating habits because this is how many calories you burn per hour of these activities. And I don't know about you, but jumping rope for an hour, if anyone can do that, I will give you a sugar-sweetened beverage. If you can jump rope continuously for an hour, that's 750 calories, but that's, that's really hard to do. So jogging, running is really the most effective way to burn calories. That's why it's a pretty effective exercise uh, modality. But even the brisk walk like you, like we do on rounds when I'm in a mood. But we burn about, so in four hours with me, you burn a thousand calories. That's why I, you can eat the donuts that I bring you. Okay, so this is just a, a few snippets that I took of activity to explain how important that is to help you burn, to lose weight. But if you're drinking three sodas a day or uh, you're drinking orange juice in the morning, a sweet tea at lunch, and then you're having, you know, I don't know, coffee with sugar at night, you, you already have, you know, about 600 calories to burn right there. So get rid of sugar-sweetened beverages. And then we have stop smoking. 
This one question is all you need to ask in your clinic. How ready are you to quit on a scale of one to 10? It has been validated that if they answer five or greater, that means they're ready to quit. So those are the people I spend my time working with. If, they, if they're not ready to quit, just try again the next time. Here's my strategies that I use here in Louisville, Kentucky. Number one, set a quit date. Something that means something to them, an anniversary, Christmas, Derby, get them to set a date. This has proven efficacy to help people quit better than if it's just a nebulous, I am gonna quit. Okay, this is like the one thing I want you to remember from today. Right now in Kentucky, Medicare and Medicaid pay for all tobacco cessation therapies, free of charge to the patient, including visits to our tobacco cessation clinic where Dr. Rachel Keith, she's a PhD nurse practitioner, will spend an hour with them talking about smoking cessation strategies. You don't spend an hour talking to them about their code status or whatever else, right? She'll spend an hour teaching them things like, for example, did you know that the gum makes a lot of people feel sick? And the reason is because they chew, 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 <coughs> chew, chew, and they swallow the stuff. You're supposed to chew it twice and then put it in your cheek. I didn't know that, Rachel taught me that. So if you have patients in clinic who answer five or greater on question number one, refer them to Rachel's clinic. I am fairly certain, I'm really certain about everything today. I know, I can tell the future. I'm pretty sure that with all the healthcare expenditure cuts that are coming, this is not gonna be paid for for very long. So this is a six week program. It has behavioral therapy, cognitive therapy, and then nicotine replacement or smoking cessation medication, all paid for and an expert to do it. So send everybody to Rachel. She is willing to be there all day long every day to get these people to quit smoking. So I think you just type in like tobacco or smoking cessation and it should be a referral that pops up in all scripts. It's ready to go. Okay, took that already. So that's it, that's Life Simple 7. And they truly are simple, but you know that getting people to do this or working on it in clinic is almost impossible. So let's go back to case number one, our 52-year-old reluctant patient who is in the office with his child size big gulp. So just some people throw out for me, if you're seeing him in clinic, what are you thinking about either what you want to, where are you gonna start, what do you wanna measure, what do you wanna treat, what are you gonna focus on with him over the next 10 minutes that you have before you have to go to your next patient? You can't attack all seven things in him right now, right? So what do you want to do? Okay, all right, great. So we have primary care, ready to roll. Okay, so lipid profile, he said. Um, you want to target, talk to him about his blood pressure, and you want to do a screening colonoscopy. Awesome, okay, I love all of that. Um, what else, anyone else want to add something? Diet. Okay, you want to talk to him about his diet? One to ten. Okay, we're going to talk to him about smoking. We got, we got everything so far. But all of these things are pretty easy so far. The dietary counseling might take a little while, but the rest of the things you're just ordering. Sure. I usually don't do all this at once. Okay. I think it makes the patient hate you. <laughs> stop smoking, stop drinking soda, stop this, stop do this. Like, it's too much for somebody. Okay, good. So I would usually, I would go with the blood pressure because I can fix it. Talk about one thing today and the next time talk about the other. Maybe do the little bit then. Okay, good. So to reiterate for those who couldn't hear, um, one strategy that we're hearing is not to hit every one of the Life Simple 7 at the same time, but to maybe take a balance between the things you as a practitioner can do and treat and versus what you're going to counsel the patient on. That's actually a lot of how I approach this guy. So I totally agree. I can order as many tests as I want today so I can get my lipids. I'm also going to get a fasting glucose because I want a fasting lipid profile. So I'm going to order all that and I can order his colonoscopy. And then my next approach, and then I can treat his blood pressure because I can write him a prescription and he can probably take a pill because those things are easier for him than the lifestyle behavior modifications that I want him to do. But then I ask this one simple question. If you could pick one thing about your health that you wanted to change, what would it be? So I asked the patient to tell me which of the rest of Life Simple 7 is their priority. And then I go with that one. So if he says his weight, or if he says smoking, I go with what the patient is motivated by and I start with that. Because if we can get some success together on one of these things, then he might be willing to tackle the others. So that's how I approach it, but this is also very difficult to do. And that's in a guy like him, right? He's reluctant to be there. He doesn't want to do this. He likes his pork rinds. And yeah, he doesn't want you to tell him all that stuff. We are obligated to, right? We have to mark off smoking cessation counseling and all this stuff. But I try to wrap that all into getting him on board with me that we're a team together. Okay, so let's 
contrast that with case number two. She is coming to you. I'm worried that I might have coronary disease. What can I do to improve my health? So she is more motivated towards ideal cardiovascular health. So to remind you about her, 55, she has hypertension. She's worried because her sister has coronary disease. Her lifestyle is pretty good already, right? Better than most of us. But then you see her labs and her uh, vital signs. So what do you want to do for this woman? Okay, so I have a vote for diet to see if we can make some improvement in that blood pressure with her salt intake. Okay, so okay, so someone wants to actually do a screening CT for coronary disease. We could talk about that in a second. I have a vote for a statin, right? Okay, so she is 55. She has hypertension. Is she stage one or stage two? I didn't give you any meds. Let's say she is treated for her hypertension, but she's not at goal, right? So um, I would actually, and you have her lipid profile. So this is the woman I would calculate her ASCVD risk score to tell me about her statin use or not, and whether she should prescribe it. And yeah, I prefer to overtreat with statins. And you're exactly right that if you calculate her ASCVD risk score, she's going to get like 7.9% because I made up the case that way. <laughs> but I want to show you the ASCVD risk score real quick. Let's do it because we have a little bit of time. For fun, let's put her in. So she was 55. She's female. She's not African American. What was her total? 250, and her LDL was 200. Is that right? Let's say that's what it was. 190. Oh, I gave her exactly 190. Oh, 2500. Holy moly. Okay. So I gave her 250. So then her HDL was 60. Her systolic blood pressure was 139. Diastolic was. Anyone remember? Let's make it up. 86, 82. Great. And she's treated for high blood pressure. She doesn't have diabetes, and she's not a smoker. Okay. So we calculate her 10-year risk comes at 3.7. I must have entered that wrong. Okay. It was 2.15 the cholesterol with the anterior Thank you. Okay. So she would qualify because of her LDL. There we go. I got us closer. Okay. So it got us up to 7.1% with that lipid profile. But you can see how this can change pretty drastically depending on what you have. So calculating that is useful. I forgot that I gave her that LDL greater than 190. So she qualifies for a statin regardless. There is inherent, this is not perfect, right? So that cutoff of 7.5 is because that's where you reach some threshold of cardiovascular disease, but it isn't that there's no risk for people lower than 7.5. So especially in someone who is a worried well and they want to be treated and they're not worried about side effects, I definitely over-treat with statins as opposed to under-treat. I don't know if you saw that recently. We get a lot of complaints in our clinic about oh, myalgias and whatnot, but there is a lot of evidence that the statins do not lead to myalgias at all, and it's really a placebo effect. So I really try to push people through with that. Okay, so we had a vote here for putting her on statin, which I totally agree with. I still like to calculate the risk and put it in my note. And then we also had someone to talk about um, diet in terms of her blood pressure. Anything else you would do for her today? Talk to her about her exercise. Okay, and what do you want her to do about her exercise? Increase the Okay. Great. So get her to increase that exercise, maybe actually do an exercise prescription. I didn't talk to you about this, but there's something called fit, frequency, intensity, type, and I don't remember the fourth one. Great. So that's how to do an exercise prescription that you can actually give to a patient, and studies have shown they're more likely to follow that than if you just say exercise in general. Good. And with those things, the salt and the exercise, you might get her... Uh, blood pressure a bit down, right? Because we can get about five millimeters of mercury with all of that. So I would probably give her the option. We could go up on your medication today because I want to get you under 130, or you could try to intensify your lifestyle, come back in three to four months and see where you're at. So that's where I would um, work with my patient to see what they prefer to do. Okay, good. Anything else you guys would think about this woman from a cardiovascular risk perspective? Yeah, question. More question for you then. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is about coronary calcium score. So that's a great question. Um, this is the exact patient where coronary calcium score pushes you over the edge. So the intention of either a high sensitivity CRP or a coronary calcium score is to help you as a tiebreaker for someone who has some risk but doesn't quite meet the criteria for a statin according to those current guidelines that we talked about. So the coronary calcium score can push you towards treatment instead of not. 
I will be honest with you that in my clinic, I, I think I have never ordered a coronary calcium score, but that's because by the time they get to me, they almost always have a diagnosis of coronary disease. In our prevention clinic, that's a place where we would use it. So I think that a coronary calcium score, which is what had been brought up earlier, would be very reasonable in this woman. Although for me, um, let's say her LDL was 150, I'm probably still gonna treat her. And just know that I'm a bit outside those recommended guidelines, but I still feel very strongly about a statin in someone for primary prevention. Yeah, another question. Um, let's say you put a blood pressure, now there's one many. She's gonna be risk of like four or five, but let's say it brings down a significant reduction in her risk. So at what point are you supposed to actually, like if every year you're gonna reevaluate this, then let's say next year her risk is lower, are you gonna take her off the statin? So the question is about uh, DCing a statin on someone if their risk goes down because you control their other risk factors. So let's try, I'm just gonna show you what happens if we control, oh I took it away, oh no, I didn't, okay. Let's control her blood pressure on here. Let's take her blood pressure, let's say we did awesome and we get her down to 125 over 65 and recalculate her risk, but it's next year, so she's a year older. And let's do that, okay. So it doesn't change your risk all that much with the blood pressure. Really the age is the driver, so as time goes on, the age is gonna take over for the risk. So um, I almost never stop a statin unless it's for side effects. Um, particularly in someone where I'm trying to aim for primary prevention. Because if I got their cholesterol controlled on the statin, so let's do that version. Let's control her cholesterol better. So we got her blood pressure down, we got her cholesterol down significantly, and her HDL came up a little bit because she exercised. Okay, so now I got her blood, I got her risk down significantly, but that's because of the statin, so I can't stop it. So my answer is I have a lot of friends and family. I'm from California, where we're all hippies there. They don't want to be on any medicines. So they're all like, I don't want to be on this medicine. And I basically say you're committed to it for life. And then if they really don't want to do, I recommend red yeast rice, extra, red rice yeast extract because they're like, oh, it's natural. It has HMG reductase in it. It's a very low amount, but it's just the same thing as a statin. But if I can't appeal to logic, I will say, great, take this red yeast rice red extract. And, uh, and then they want to take CoQ10, but they don't want to take a statin. I don't know. You can only get so far. Good. There's another question somewhere out there. Yes? I get a lot of pushback for starting statins. People are afraid of it because like, the women's health initiative is uh, thing. Um, but for, I've had patients with low calcium scores, or like totally clean vessels with out of whack lipid panels, and they're resistant to starting medication for that reason. What kind of things do you say to them or convince them to start it? Is it even needed? So the question is for patients who might uh, meet criteria for a statin based on ASCVD risk score, let's say, but have a uh, zero coronary calcium score or very low, and or maybe they had a cath or a stress test that was negative and they're reluctant to do so. Um, you know, you can only lead a horse to water, you can't make it drink. So there is no doubt in my mind, as someone who takes care of acute ischemia, that our rates of ST elevation in eyes have decreased dramatically in this country, and that's shown with epidemiologic data. And and that is singularly because of statins. We haven't done anything else for these lifestyle things, right? None of our other risks, everything is worse. More hypertension, more obesity, more sugar-sweetened beverages, you know, everything else is worse. So statins are life-saving. So I am very strong about saying that to people, like this pill will save your life. This will delay or even prevent you from having a heart attack in the future. Now, a zero coronary calcium score is a very powerful negative predictor. So if you have a score of zero, your 10-year risk of an event is also almost zero percent. So that might be something powerful enough if they really don't want to take the statin that I would stop it or not start it. The other thing that's a really powerful predictor is if on a Bruce protocol stress, stress test, if they can walk 11 minutes on a Bruce protocol with no ischemia, their 10-year risk of an MI is also almost zero percent. Um, but most people stop long before 11 minutes. Anyone ever done a Bruce protocol? You are running by 11 minutes and you're running uphill. So I did one when I was a worried medical student that I was like, oh no, my heart rate goes up so high when I exercise. I was just out of shape, that's all. But uh, I did a Bruce protocol and you were like huffing and puffing by minute 11. So those are the two um, 
uh, long-standing epidemiologic evidence that I have that may trump my ASCVD risk score. Um, but then I also try to tell them that none of these tests are perfect. Just because you don't have calcium in the arteries doesn't mean you don't have soft plaque. And we know that it's the soft 30% lesions that actually rupture. It's the tight 80% calcified lesions that give us angina. So that's a balance as well. Yes, another question. Same foundation where like the current doctors were low um, and they have the, the other ones So the question is, in the same type of patient, where I go to another screening test aside from coronary calcium score to help me tip the balance in terms of treating them for cardiovascular risk? Um, usually not. Coronary calcium is the most validated and strongest predictor of outcomes. So as opposed to carotid intimal medial thickness or something else, coronary calcium is really the best score. I caution you against taking a low score and thinking that's good. It's really zero or anything else. The zero score is the main thing that I love. If the score is really zero, that has that strong negative predictive value. If there's even any calcium, that that's not as strong of a predictor. So coronary calcium of zero, I'm dancing around and yay, uh, but that's probably genetic and nothing to do with lifestyle. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna just finish up here in the last um, minute or so to give you my tips and tricks. So in my internal medicine or primary care clinic, here's what I approach. Measure and treat the blood pressure, that's easy. It's not hard for them to do, it's what you do. Calculate everybody's BMI, you'll be surprised. Uh, All script does this for you, um, but it's always amazing to me. Everybody gets their fasting lipid profile, calculate ASC video risk, or just put it on your phone, plug it in, and give everybody a statin. I think we should sprinkle it in the water, personally. Ask them about their personal health goals. For me, this is the most powerful part. Make it a partnership. Ask them what they want to target and go with that because you can't do everything else. Ask them about the smoking and then have Rachel talk to them about that over an hour so you don't have to. And then here's the things, the low-hanging fruit I recommend for my patients. Realistic weight loss goal and the time frame in which to do it. Take the stairs. I recommend this for all of you as well. It is amazing where we all take the elevator from one freaking flight of stairs. <laughs> so take the stairs, it adds you an extra little bit of calorie burnage every day and it just gets in the habit, it's a good idea over time. I've talked to you ad nauseum about sugar sweetened beverages, how they are the root of all evil. For tobacco, ask them to set a quit date and here's how I recommend it. Let's say they decide they want to quit by derby, which is three months away. They cut it in half every month until they get there because most people are around one pack a day. So go down to half a pack now then a quarter pack a month from now, then, a, then an eighth a pack a month after that, and they're almost done. So that's what I recommend. And then I do try to eliminate all the Fs, fast food, fried food, and frozen food for the most part. What's that, And In food in general, yeah. Eliminate most of your food. <laughs> Sorry, I guess a good way. Um, Mrs. Dash is what I recommend to replace salt because you can find it in pretty much every grocery store. It has a lot of flavor and there's no salt in it. So people will try to say, no, it's a salt substitute. That's usually potassium chloride and it still is going to have a similar osmotic effect. So don't recommend salt substitutes except for Mrs. Dash or lemon pepper is the other thing I recommend. I like this thing called Veget. Has anyone ever heard of that before? Oh my gosh, it's so good. But you can only order it on Amazon. Okay. And then for your really motivated people, a blood pressure and a weight journal like we do for our heart failure patients, and that's going to help you to treat them better over the course of time. If you want to calculate your own, see how close to ideal cardiovascular health you are or get depressed and cry a little bit, go to this website that will tell you in, in actually about your activities, your diet, etc., and tells you where you're, how you're doing. And of course, I always like to end with a wonderful saying. This says, motivation. If a pretty poster and a cute saying are all it takes to motivate you, you probably have a very easy job the kind that robots will be doing soon. That's to remind you that you don't have an easy job. Being a primary care provider and trying to deal with this while you're also treating their scleroderma and their adrenal disease and you're trying to keep them out of the hospital and do their, give them their flu shot and whatever, this is a really, really, really hard job. Um, so I know you don't have time to get to all of these things in clinic. That's why I like the idea of setting one thing at a time and trying to work with the patients. Um, but you are also the front line to keep them from ever coming to me in the ICU. And then this is also to remind you that for patients, motivation is really hard to get to. And so whatever we can do to help motivate them is really important. I think we should just make the elevators out of service and then everyone would have to take the stairs. Any other questions for me before we go? All right, I'm going to go back to the CCU, which is what happens if you don't prevent cardiovascular disease. Thanks, guys.